You may also know me from uh, Pyro CMS, uh, which apparently I joke about quite a lot. Um, <laughs> Pyro CMS has always been a coding lights at CMS, uh, which is these days realised that coding lights are is, um, not stagnating, but it's not doing as many cool things as it could be. So I'm switching over to using uh, Laravel. Um, it's coming along quite well. We've got like uh, 2.3, so quite a lot of everything in there, so that's good stuff. Um, I used to be on the development team for Codemeter uh, and for PhD, um, and I've been involved with Pancake App and a whole bunch of other random projects. Uh, PHP the right way, it's another project I've been involved with, telling people how to write better code, what's going on, it's a good learning resource, all about exceptions and SPR uploaders, all that good stuff. And because I love the sound of my own voice, I set up a podcast called PHP Town Hall. Um, I'm on the PHP FIG, uh, and I have a weird accent, which some of you may have noticed already. Um, I'm not Australian, Irish, Canadian, South African. I am from Bristol in the UK, um, and that's my Twitter handle if anyone cares. So uh, this quote is kind of why I love the idea of a composer. Um, I can spend ten minutes writing some stuff, but stuff it. It's not necessarily what he said. Uh, I can just install Gem. Um, this is my friend. He's a big Ruby fan um, back in the UK, and this, this is exactly how most uh, most languages work. Um, Ruby gems, for example, have so many gems, there's loads of gems. There's things like Warden, um, OmniAuth, uh, which do like, they integrate with everything. You can just throw that in, it'll integrate with Warden or other authentication systems, and straight out of the box you've got integrations with Facebook, Foursquare, Twitter, Instagram, you name it. There's some Russian ones in there, I have no idea what they're called. Uh, OpenID support out of the box. Bloody brilliant LDAP as well, actually. You can just buy in a gem, and you don't ever have to write any code for LDAP. Like, who would want to? Um, OAuth and OAuth1, there's like, OAuth1 and OAuth2 both have like one go-to gem. It's not like 20 or 30. They're not like there's not one for Rails and one for Sumatra. There's just you use those gems, and that's just how it works. And they're really well built. And because everyone knows they exist, they just use those. If anyone's got a feature to add or a bug to fix, they just add them in with a pull request, and everyone wins. Like who wants to? Has anyone tried writing OAuth code, like integration code, not using at the SDK or anything else? Yeah, like well done to you guys that bothered. It's so ridiculous. Like every single every single uh, API you use, Foursquares, like they use OAuth 2 spec 19, I think, and the final version is 22A or something. It's it's hard work. So th these guys take all of it for you. Um, Thor and Clam are two like a Symphony console uh, package. They they take care of command line stuff and Active Record <coughs> is the ORM. Like there's there's not that there might be one or two others, but no one cares. Like if you're using an ORM in Ruby, you're gonna be using Active Record. Uh, and Python's exactly the same. Python has something called pip, um, and there's a bunch of really good, uh, really good packages. There's um, requests, which is like the go-to example for anyone that wants to work out how to make a HTTP request pass. We import it to PHP, it's genius. Um, it's uh, quite a lot better than the, uh, the curl API for PHP. Um, pill image manipulation, you can do a whole bunch of stuff to images in like two lines of code, you can resize it and have it like watermarked, it's really easy. All these other things, Flask, good, good recipe micro framework, and PyYAML. Just if you need something, you look for the package and you install it, and you never have to worry about writing language yourself. Every other language has them. I don't care about Perl, but they have a massive uh, selection of, of libraries available. Um, Node, exact same situation going on. They have npm. You can run npm install, and you've got all sorts of stuff going on. No work, situation, everything else. Um, and PHP. What do we have? Hey! <laughs> <laughs> Do a little bit of uh, a little bit of crowd uh, crowd interaction here. So uh, put your hands up and keep them raised until it gets with no answer. Who's used pair? Who likes pair? <laughs> <laughs> that was easy. Um, there was like two other questions I forgot to ask in there, but they went up with everyone putting their hands down. Uh, one random little thing I found out the other day uh, on their homepage is like known good packages against PHP 5.4 because they support PHP 5.4 there's so many times. You know what happens when you click that link? Yeah, it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> um, installing stuff with pair, like you, you want to set up pair, you have to install the P, uh, PHP pair package and the PHP 5 dev package because they can add in some extensions here and there, then you have to go and discover what channel you want to use because everyone's on a different channel. If you want to be on the main pair channel, you have to get upvoted by like 20 people or something. And if you just release a piece of code and no one knows what it is, no one's going to upvote it, so no one can install it, so no one upvotes it and screw you. Um, but if you do manage to write some code, you magically like, game the system and get some code in there, then, then you can install it this way, otherwise you have to 
and the channel. And yeah, I I fell asleep before I even bothered to doing code. Um, a good example of an active package that people link to and recommend the net gear, given to job queue system. Uh, Zach Itzman there will be talking about job queues tomorrow. Um, and this is one that lots of people have recommended to me. Now, if we look here, it's on version 0.2.3 alpha, and that's how far they got by 2009. So, if you scroll down the page, you can see there's like three people involved and two of them are inactive. So, awesome! I really want to use that code, and I have so much confidence that it will actually work. If you look at the modern package list, this is the most modern package uh, as of last week that I looked at. It's in validation IE, which doesn't mean Internet Explorer, it needs Irish. I, I don't even know what that means. Uh, so I can validate Irish things. It supports, <laughs> <laughs> it supports PHP 4.4, which is great. Uh, it works with a basic version of the installer, and it requires uh, validate finance, which is only on 0.5, so it's barely even reached a final version yet. Um, so again, this is the most modern package kicking around. I don't have that much faith for, for most of the code that's on there. It's a little bit worrying. Um, Pair 2 came along with the intention of fixing all the things and making it better and making it more fun. Um, if you look at the recent packages list here, you'll see September uh, 25. So that's relatively recent, I guess, last year. Um, there's only 19 packages on here. Uh, the most recent news article is like January 2012. Um, so yeah, there's, there's just nothing happening there. Look at the pair two, Git, they've moved over to GitHub, which is good. They were on CVS for a while. No one told them about subversion, apparently. Um, they've got 23 repos, which is weird, because they only actually have 19 packages on the pair website, so there's some magic there. Um, and the original pair extension, uh, pair repository, has 485. So I don't know why they haven't converted to pair two yet, but what? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I think with those random things we've established, the, the pair not necessarily sucks. I'm sure there's some good code on there. I'm sure lots of people have put good time and effort and energy into making code that, that works so well. But like PHP unit for a long time was only installable by a pair, and it was good. Um, there's a lot of PHP mess detector tools and the code sniffer stuff and all these various tools, all available over pair, but you have to install like 50 different things and, and it's just a pain. Um, so because of, because of pair being odd, um, and the fact that not many of you used it successfully to do anything, right? Has anyone ever like used it and been like, that was cool, it didn't take me half an hour and it worked straight away, but no one's ever done that. So PHP for a long time, developers were happy with copying and pasting code off of like a random wiki or someone's blog, and they'll just copy that little class and they'll bug it into their uh, code base, and they'll use that for a month, and then eventually they might notice a tweet from somebody that says like they've updated their blog, and they'll go, oh cool, there's a new version available, let's copy and paste that one. Not realizing they've had some like, gaping bug in their application for the last year since they saw that tweet. So if PHP developers are happy with that approach, then like the tool that they have available to them must be awful. Um, so to avoid this, frameworks came around. Um, we're all pretty happy about that. Like, yeah, uh, Code Maya, Kahana, Kate, all these things. Uh, yeah, Code Maya. Who's used Code Maya in this room? Just like everyone here. Right? <coughs> oh, right. Who's not used Code Maya? It's like four of you. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I figured this is a crowd where we might know it. So Code Maya came along. It wasn't the first by any means. Uh, Code Maya came out in two thousand and six. There was Kate PHP in two thousand and five. Uh, Symphony came out in 2005, uh, all these other things that uh, we care about. But this is the first one to actually advertise on their homepage as the second top um, benefit to using this was it's not Pair. Right? So people really weren't happy with Pair in 2006. Um, and that to me seems like a big thing. If, Pair, like, if the only package management system we have is, uh, is like avoided this heavily, then that kind of says something. But strangely, the other benefit was that you want a framework that does not require the command line. Now this, at the time, was a big selling point because people were looking at things like Rails and they're like, ah, I have to use the command line, I want to FTP sync all the things instead, and they're kind of getting scared by it. But I think as a web developer, if you're not using the command line, as a programmer in general, if you're not using the command line, then you're probably doing it wrong. Um, I mean, you can carry on FTP syncing things until the end of time, but it's not 19, so don't do that. Um, so okay, we ended up having these uh, these frameworks that, that were all the code, and they had everything in there in one go, and all these features you could get with one piece of code, you could jam that on your FTP server, and you know <coughs> that um, you know that everything would work together. There wasn't dependency injection to worry about. 
there wasn't like any weird stuff going on. It was just a whole bunch of code that was smashed together. And uh, uh, so yeah, so you've got database interaction, benchmarking, caching, calendar systems, email, <laughs> shopping cart library, which I don't know why Derek Allen put that in code and I said, but yay for him. Um, <laughs> All this stuff, you have all this stuff, which is great. You don't have to worry about where to find it, what channel it's on, if it works with the latest version of what you've got. You don't have to worry about any of that. You can just use that. Um, and, and everyone <laughs> felt very happy about that whole situation. Like, they felt like they had the one true tool that could do whatever. Like, they could do everything. Um, but then after a while, it kind of turned into this. Um, and this is when I started making some noise in the code in my community, just kind of wondering why nothing was happening. It felt like a real uphill battle. I posted, my main go-to example is in 2008, I posted uh, a FTP download class. They have an upload method, but they didn't have a download method. I posted it on the forums, and someone replied saying, yeah, we'll throw that in, and it didn't get into 2010, like the end of the year. It's like, ah, it's, it's like bugs, bugs weren't happening. Bug reports were like going around, and I came across a bug, uh, a bug and I ended up looking into it and fixing it, and it took me ages to work out what the problem was. And then it turns out, um, again, I'm, I'm sorry, it sounds like I'm being mean about Derek Allen, he's a lovely guy, I love the Canadian guy. Um, <laughs> but he, he ended up buying me a beer for it in the end, so I let him off. But he, he knew about this bug, uh, he, he knew the fix to the bug, he just forgot to implement it because their entire bug management system was based around if someone remembered that there was a forum post around it and then got to it in that same day. So getting bugs and everything else fixed was just a pain. So Kahana came along, this was eventually just a fork, so a bunch of people saying, we want to fix things, we want to do bugs ourselves, we don't want to just, you know, we, we tried working with you and it's not working out. And that caused a whole bunch of, of hubbub at the time and then everyone got over it, but brought a new um, way of looking at PHP as opposed to the way that we've been doing it for all of these versions. So instead of us making like, pass it a massive array and if you need more options, just build more of an array. It was like, let's use pullbacks properly, let's do this neatly and, and cleanly. So if you compare the schema class um, in, in Laravel 3 to the uh, DB forge in Codeniter, that's a perfect example of how you use pullbacks to make something not suck. Um, the IOC, as we've gone through in every, every talk so far, is a, uh, it's another brilliant feature that, that Laravel 3 brought, and, and bundles were good. So bundles is the crux of what I'm about to talk about, um, and, and bundles, Laravel 3 wasn't the first thing to have bundles. Um, Codeniter had sparks. Fuel PHP had cells and Laravel 3 had bundles. Um, they're all basically the exact same thing. They're all, I want to run this command, I want some code to be installed, and then I want to use it in my framework. Which is exactly what Pear was doing. But because we all hated Pear, well, it's a strong word, but none of us liked Pear. Um, we weren't really using it, we were only really using it. And then the framework packages came along, and they seemed like they were the solution to all our problems. But then you have this problem. <laughs> this is all my code. I wrote <laughs> <laughs> it's the same thing. It's so annoying. Um, I wrote code writer auth two. It was lovely. Um, I then needed it for a, for a project I was working on in Fuel. Ported it over. So now I'm maintaining two packages. And someone sent in a pull request, and I've got to manually copy and paste it and translate it back, which is ridiculous. And then um, something that Taylor was working on needed auth two integration. He thought that code works pretty well. I'll just convert it. So now we have three different versions, three different sets of issues and bugs and, and everything else to fix. It's ridiculous. Um, so the answer to all of these problems are, is Composer. Composer has a one main repository uh, called Packages. <coughs> so instead of the whole pair situation where you have to get upvoted and, and, and whatnot to get into the actual repository, you can, anyone can post this. The answer to that is that anyone can post to this. But, <laughs> you get ratings and install numbers, so if someone posts some junk, it's gonna go straight to the bottom and no one will ever know. Um, packages is good, I mean, the website's crusty, I'll be honest. Um, it's, it's clearly been put together by developers, but it's, it's open source, it's online, it's on GitHub, anyone can improve this, and, and one day I really hope that uh, I have some spare freelance money kicking around to, to get a designer to actually work on it. But one day, someone will make this look pretty. In the meantime, the main point is that we have um, some cool command stuff that we can do. So, this is a little, uh, a little example, which I'll put online somewhere at some point. Um, just make yourself, this, we're going to create a new application from scratch. Um, you make a new directory called Playground, uh, go inside it, and then run this little one-liner here. As long as you're fine with um, executing code 
uh, from a remote website. You can install it <laughs> quickly. <laughs> Pretty sure we can trust him. It's, uh, it's a good lab to put code, so let's just assume it's not going to like, steal your credit card information. Um, and then once you do that, you, you ls the folder, and you have this brand new uh, composer.far. Does anyone ever know what fars are? Or not know what fars are? It's a PHP archive. Um, so it's, it should be like a zip, or like a tar file, or like some other existing uh, system, but it's kind of legacy and very specific to PHP. And after the original guy made it, no one really knows how it works, but it works, so that's a good one. Um, it's an executable file, it's kind of like having a, 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 just an exe, or a binary, or a shell file, or whatever. You just you run some code and it works. Um, and then you want to create a composer.json. In, um, uh, in, in other languages, it would be the, the same as the gem file, or the, uh, the MVM modules file. Or whatever, um, it, this is where you list your stuff. And the stuff at the very basic level looks like this. You put in a minimum stability level, which is beta. If you're using beta software, you have to change this so you can do it. So if you're using Laravel, you have to currently use this, otherwise, it should be um, a dev, it's like bleeding edge. Or you can use stable, which is what you want to do before your code goes live, um, unless you like living on the edge and want random surprises whenever you deploy your code. Um, this is an example of, of I've included a uh, speed and whatnot. Markdown version one. You see the little star here it means that you can say I want one o anything. So that means you're trusting the developer to say if you release one o two, one o three, one o four, go ahead and do that. I don't have to think about it. Some random security bug gets fixed. Cool. And then you're you're kind of hoping that they'll keep anything that will break your application to version one point one, which most logical developers do. Um, but otherwise, you you want to specify the versions and then maybe check back later. Um, an illuminate database. Um, this is taken from some live code. I literally said, whatever the hell Taylor's done today, give me that. Um, so once you've saved that file uh, to install them, all you want to do is uh, run dot slash composer dot file install. You can do like you can, if if you kind of get annoyed with having to do this, you can move it into your user bin folder, which is something I do quite a lot. Um, and you just do like mv composer.far and then shut it into slash user bin composer and then you can run composer like any other command on your, on your computer. Um, I guess when you run it, it will say stuff and it will download it and unless it's like last Friday where the networks went down, it will install perfectly. I left quite early on Friday. <laughs> the service just went down, there's nothing to be done about it. But most of us, they haven't had problems that much. If you want to support other repos, so if you have private code that you don't want to necessarily release to the entire public, uh, you can list repositories here. Uh, so you can have GitHub private repos, uh, you can have SVN repos if you want to pretend it's the 90s. Um, and then you can just acquire them as you would normally. So, this whole composer approach is nothing special to Laravel. And it does a very good job, which is why I'm you know, supporting the pirate. Uh, but Aura is another one made by. Um, PM Jones, it's a relatively well-known PHP developer. Um, so uh, Zen Framework 2 has moved across to using this completely, and obviously Symfony, as we've discussed, is doing the same thing. So there's a few, uh, there's a few things that are doing completely supporting Composer. KPHP is also moving all of their stuff over. I think version 3 is going to be completely Composer-based. Uh, they're PHP 5.4 only, so I'm kind of staying away from that for now, because at Capture, we use the latest version of PHP, Pirate CMS, kind of have to use 5.3, just because people are still stuck with it. Right, why am I not just using those? Uh, so as, as Taylor's already gone through, in, um, in Symfony, uh, there's a lot of boilerplate going on, and it just, sometimes it sucks to have to write that code. Like you're, if you look at some of the examples of what they do, it's like, I want to do this basic thing, I've got to inject 75 different into other places. So a lot of your controllers are getting littered, um, and obviously the IOC and the service providers and the facade and Laravel, uh, they give you the same power of being able to uh, dependency inject all of those things, but at the same time they've wrapped it up in this beautiful way, as Jeffrey's already shown you, where you can kind of have this really complex logic and then just kind of tuck that under the cap <coughs> and then use it perfectly well from there on. Um, so that's one of the massive benefits for, for Laravel for me. Um, and the other part is that, that that creates a much lower barrier to entry. Uh, a big part of the reason why we use CodeNotor for Pyro CMS is that anyone can use it. Like, with co anyone can work out CodeNotor. Any, any brand new PHP developer can look at CodeNotor and go, 
I understand this, this is easy, right? And that doesn't mean you have to be stupid to use it, it doesn't mean you only want stupid users, it means that if you bring on a junior or an intern, or just a new developer, they want to look at that code. Is it important? <laughs> no? Okay. This from the hospital, we take that. <laughs> um, the lower barriers of entry is important, not just for people, but um, not just for, for you, right? If you're working on a team, it, it's, it's important to have simple, readable code, and that's why for a long time, uh, Laravel uh, Coding Mixer was my, my go-to framework. Um, but it's basically because you have two kinds of developers in the community. You have this guy, that's like two extremes in the, uh, in the PHP community. This buddy here, and then this guy. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to cater for. I mean, the more people that can, the more people that can write expression, uh, more people that can write add-ons for Pyro CMS means more money in my pocket. So. The applications to everybody. Um, so where is Laravel? Um, we have the GitHub Laravel framework, which is the, um, as, as Taylor explained, kind of the, the main place in which all of the code exists. And then uh, you have the Laravel Laravel, which is essentially a, a sample application which you can use. Um, and then you have the GitHub.com Illuminate, which is where Laravel originally existed as loads of separate components. But now it's it's uh, like read-only um, subtree splits, whatever, of, of the main Laravel framework. So if you want to use a specific component, go to Illuminate and click around. If you want to use the whole thing, go to Laravel framework or the, um, the main Laravel repo. But it's in the tree develop branch because it's not final yet. So if you want to go from like 0 to 60 in Laravel, the first thing to do is clone the uh, github.com slash Laravel slash Laravel git. Um, <coughs> when I create, a, uh, create an application uh, that's going to be based off of Laravel, I want to keep. I don't want to clone Laravel because then when I push, it's going to try pushing back to Laravel. I don't want to give you my application. That'd be ridiculous. So you can name the uh, the origin with the uh, dash o as Laravel. The power of that means that when I want to update my application, I can say git pull Laravel, and all of the random latest changes that have happened means I don't have to go through all the Taylor's commits and go, oh, we changed this migration config folder. You just pull it and it changes everything. Um, and then you do uh, hyphen B, means you're on the develop branch straight away. And then playground means we're going to put it in a playground folder. So you can, that'll be the name of your application or whatever else. So again, as we did earlier, CD into the playground, install composer, and then run it. And uh, that will that'll create everything for you. Um, if you want to build your own packages, what you can do is use the PHP Artisan Workbench, which takes so much of the load off of you creating a composer package. You get given this dialog sequence, which is, uh, what's the name? Epic. What's the, the, so the vendor name is going to be your company, your name, your initials, something unique. Um, this is for like PSR also um, The name of the package is Unicorn. Um, my name is Phil Sturgeon, and you put your email address. This helps build up um, not only the file structure, but it helps build up the um, it also builds the metadata for the composer JSON. And it builds you an entire bunch of stuff. Um, okay, so if you look at the main application route, you see the app folder, artisan, the command line stuff we've been running, a bunch of other noise, and the workbench folder. So this workbench folder is where your epic unicorn package will be put. So that folder looks like this. Um, so each one, again, we're going to have the, the vendor name, the package name. So all my packages will be in the same folder and then the stuff that Dave wrote will be in Dave's folder. Um, and you have all these things. So the Travis is going to help you with unit testing. Composer is going to be the metadata to help you install your unit tests. Everyone, do them. Um, public folder means you can put like assets and, and other stuff in there. This is a very Laravel specific feature. Um, and then you have this main source, source folder. So this stuff, again you have Epic Unicorn repeated, which to many people seems really bizarre. Um, but this is to support PSR zero. Um, and that basically means that when you point at the source folder, that's another location that you can scan through. And then when you do epic slash unicorn slash whatever, it will know to look in those folders. So it's a bit of a weird step at first, but it's very powerful. Um, and then you also have config, lang, migration, views, which Laravel knows to look for those folders in the source folder um, to help you add extra things. So if you build an authentication package, you might want to put like a login view in there or whatever. Um, and the test folder, where your test will live. <laughs> so there's actually a lot of a lot of hard work saved. Everybody else doing this is doing this all by hand. Um, so having that structure built for you immediately, it's very helpful. 
and this sort of aforementioned unicorn uh, service provider. Um, that will help you uh, create your, uh, that, that helps integrate it into Laravel. So any Composer package whatsoever can be used inside Laravel 4, which is brilliant. Um, but the service provider helps you kind of wrap it up in a facade, -y, facade -y way instead of referencing it in a complicated fashion. So this is the default metadata that's been built. Uh, by the workbench, I haven't changed any of this. Um, it puts in the name of the package, so everybody else can reference that <coughs> unicorn in their packages, and that's all good. Um, so my name, my email address, requires PHP 5.3, you can change it up to 4 if you want. Um, it requires Illuminate support, which is um, just a whole bunch of really useful stuff uh, that you can use um, in your packages. So it's like requiring the very smallest amount of Laravel possible to, to, to make things. You can delete that and not require it at all. But it's, it's got some handy functions in there which you can look through in the, in the code. Um, and then we go, go on to the autoloading section. So there are three ways you can autoload the composer. One of them is files. You say, that's a file, load it. Um, the other one's class map, where you pass it a, uh, um, a folder path or a file path again, similar. And it will go through every, every single class in there. It will look through for a class which has the same file name. And then they will, it builds a, an array which speeds up your auto loading process. In things like Kobe Lighter and Kohana and everywhere else, whenever you reference a class and it doesn't know what it is, it goes, okay, maybe it's in this folder. No, this folder. No, this folder. No, this folder. And if you have like 12 classes that are doing that, you've just hit the, I don't want to do maps, you've hit your data, you've hit your file system a lot of times, right? And that's a bad idea. Uh, the slowest thing you can do pretty much in an application without contacting a third party service is hit the file system. So having a class map means it goes straight there. Um, and again, so we're referencing epic slash unicorn. This is an exact replica of the folder structure, which is also the exact replica of the namespacing situation. So it's vendor namespace, optional package namespace, and then anything slash will be directly in that folder. Um, and we're marking our stability as dev, because it's a dev package and we haven't, we haven't built a stable version for it yet. Unit tests. So the two tools that Laravel Workbench uh, recommend by default um, is the PHP unit system, which you can download via pair, um, or the <laughs> You can also do it via com Composer, which is much easier. Um, or you can, you can use Travis CI. Now you can use Travis, there's a whole bunch of testing tools. Laravel recommends Travis mostly because they have bought, um, they, they, they bring uh, unit testing and kind of continuous integration is what I mean bring continuous integration to everybody in the very most simple way possible. Um, you, can, you can use Travis CI, log in for an account, log in with your GitHub account, um, create a new project, set up a GitHub hook, and then whenever you push your code, it goes, nope, you broke it, which is really handy. Um, another tool to use is Jenkins. Anyone here had a really easy time setting up Jenkins? No hands. No. I cried. Um, it's really good. It, it, we use it at Capture, we use Jenkins because it handles a lot of deployments and build integration, lots of stuff. With the, like, we have some Ruby tests and we have a bunch of stuff. But if you're just building a component using Jenkins, it's just masochism. It's, it's way too much hard work. Um, so Travis CI is good. And Laravel will build you a, uh, a Travis XML, uh, YML file, which is super simple. Like It just says, this is PHP, we want to test it on these two versions. You can point out specific versions if you want. Um, and then, before it runs, it's going to install Composer, run the install with the dev switch, which means that if you have PHP unit or mess detector or any other developer-only packages that you want to install, it will install all of your main packages and then the dev ones too. And then script is just run PHP unit. So if you've installed PHP unit as a Composer package, it will end up being um, like p uh, dot slash vendor slash bin slash PHP unit, right? But, same thing. <coughs> so you've heard me mentioning PSR. Everybody, who doesn't know what PSR is? Are people scared to put their hands up, or does everyone know exactly what PSR is? That, excellent. So PHP, well, I guess I defined it underneath, so if you didn't know in 10 seconds, you know exactly what it is now. Um, <laughs> so PHP, um, PSR stands for PHP Standard Recommendation. Um, and these are kind of recommendations and guidelines set up by the Framework Interoperability Group. Is that right? Um, which is a group of people that work for, uh, that work for, represent, contribute to 
um, these projects, uh, the, amongst a few, there's like 22 now, I think. And these are some of the biggest projects around, and mine. Um, which, they're like Drupal, Joomla, PHP, B, KPHP, loads of them. Even Pear, which is hilarious. And, um, <laughs> and everyone's working like together to try and make really useful uh, PHP code. Laravel is not currently part of this group, that's not for like a team's trying. Um, he, the membership process is essentially, you say, sup, can I join? And then people go, meh, or no. And we had a couple of yes votes, but there wasn't enough, uh, there wasn't enough for him to get in. And that's uh, mainly because people didn't know who he was. The process is you have to like, like chat away on the, on the mailing list quite a lot, and then people go, okay, so if Taylor tries to get soon, hopefully that'll work. And then uh, Laravel can have a say in how, how these things work too. Um, but we've created a couple of standards. I say we, the PSRO, for me, I was part of it, but the group um, created this very basic naming standard, which, which Laravel uses. And it's basically, as I said before, the vendor name, then an optional namespace, and then the class name. Um, so that just means that like, if two people make a class with foo, then the vendor name's different, so they never conflicts. Um, and then everything else is, is tucked away inside there. Inside your namespace, if you do session underscore cache, that leads to session slash cache. So that's again another very simplistic way of importing your files. Um, and it must have a top level namespace. There's no global code allowed. You can't, you can't break other people's stuff. No one wants to read the exact guidelines for each of these standards. I have a little bitly link there. Um, so PSR, zero, that. Some jerk took PSR hyphen one, so I've had to go with uh, PSR one. <laughs> Um, and this, basically every, PSR 0, 1, 2 are supersets of the standard recommendation before it. So to support PSR 1, the first rule is you have to support PSR 0. But each one builds on top of it. So instead of just being like a basic auto-loading, the PSR 1 standard or recommendation is a basic coding standard. And this is just, <coughs> at the most basic level, this is how you can write code that's not going to completely screw up somebody else's code. I've had, I was looking at some code and uh, it was like a date management system and one of the first things it did was like set your time zone to GMT, um, which is no good. Like, you, don't want, you don't want people messing up um, your code. You can, um, everything has to be UTF-8 because that causes problems. Um, you have to either define a class or create a side effect. So you can yeah, define a class or run a class, but you can't do both in the same things. That's confusing. Um, Constants drop a case because shut up, do it. Um, and class names are study caps, and method names are camel case. Now this has caused so much fuss in the internet. And I'm sure with this like, whole community, everyone's having a big old problem with it right now, because obviously everything was underscores, and now it's camel case. That's annoying. But to be fair, you're using a language where every single core class is camel case. So not using camel case is like, da 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 you're not paying attention to the language itself. Um, PSR2 was split up from PSR1. It was initially PSR1 A and B, and everyone knew it was controversial, so this is completely optional. If you don't like PSR2, that's great, don't talk about it. Um, so many arguments on the internet about this, it's ridiculous. You should probably limit your characters so there's not like a thousand on one line. Um, your file names uh, need to be UT, uh, Unix, LF, because otherwise whenever you change something, it will just make the whole file has changed. Uh, the closing tag should be removed because otherwise you have white space in there. Just, just don't use closing tags in your files, there's no reason for them to be there. Um, and you must use four spaces instead of indent indentation. Which again, who's upset about this? Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter. Like, the IDE can totally handle this for you. I was initially annoyed about this and then I changed to the blind text setting and I've never even noticed the difference since. It just doesn't matter. Um, it's mostly so you can install it on loads of different, um, loads of different servers. You can paste it into like, Times New Roman or you can paste it anywhere. And it always looks exactly the same on anyone's computer, on any OS, on, on any system. Exactly the same, so this is helpful. Should you PSR2? Maybe, no one cares. Um, PSR0 and PSR1 are no brainers. Like if you're gonna create some components, you wanna use namespaces to avoid infecting global, global state, so why not use PSR0? If you're gonna create a system, you might as well use PSR1, because the only difference outside is camel case. And how annoying is it when you have, if you're creating an application like with Pyro CMS, if I'm installing a system which, um, if I wanna install a component and it has underscores, like same case, then that looks different to every other piece of code I have in the system. That makes me look bad. I don't want to use your component, so you're going to turn me off just by not using the PSO1. Um, types of spaces, don't care. Shush. And, uh, and PS, uh, Laravel is kind of PSR2, it's PSR2-ish. 
Um, it does. It follows all the rules apart from brackets are not at the end of the line, they're on the new line, and they use tabs instead of spaces. I'll say choice, no one cares. Uh, it's all inside the file, it just, it just doesn't matter. How do we use framework, how do we use composer packages to avoid this situation? Interfaces. So Sentry, built by Ben Goddard, raise a hand. Uh, built this system, um, this, is, this is an example of the um, session system. Sentry is an, Sentry is an authentication system uh, that uses, um, that you can run it anywhere. It's completely framework agnostic, and it's got sessions and cookie integration, uh, which runs natively, so looking at the session and cookie global variables, um, it's got one for uh, Codemeter, Fuel PHP, and Illuminate, essentially, so you can use it with anything. And then an interface in the middle. The interface looks like this. I want to get a key, I want to put a key, I want to get a key, and I want to forget all about a key. Um, and this is just an interface, which means the other, there's drivers for each framework, that can implement those. And then each one of these methods they uh, implement. So we put, talk to this, store, and then set underscore user data, which is a code and letter specific method um, for installing, uh, for, for say, for programming something in Sentry. Uh, this is then some horrible code. This is the code that I'm using to um, integrate. <laughs> you see Ben Chuckle here below. This is pretty bad. This is not, this looks like a lot scary code. This is the code I have to write to integrate Sentry into my application because I'm using Pyro CMS and it has a whole bunch of weird different things that need to be handled. But the power of this is that I can say, um, I want to use the native hasher, which means I can, I can use the, the PHP uh, hashing API. Um, uh, and I, I could also use a random bcrypt thing, or I could use third party systems. I then say, oh, my sessions are going to be handled by this session, which is injecting the code writer object in there. Um, and I can control exactly how it's set up. Now, you wouldn't want to do this on every controller, it would just be scary. But the point is, I can write, I can put this, I've tucked it away in one little method, and then when I use Laravel, when I switch Pyro across to Laravel in the core, I can then say, um, the, uh, I can bung it in the IOC container, and I never look at this again. So I just kind of tuck it under the carpet, everything's perfectly set up exactly how I want it, and then it's tucked away and no one ever cares, which is much better than the alternative of, you can use it with your system, tough, right? So it's gross, but it works. Talking about Pyro CMS, um, PyroCMS 2.2, I'm sorry, I get it. PyroCMS 2.2 is uh, PHP 5.2 only and it completely uses the code base, nothing else. Um, PyroCMS 2.3 is the next version about to come out, which is uh, PHP 5.3 compatible, which means we can start to leverage Composer and a bunch of packages. That includes Sentry, it includes the um, Illuminate database and a few other Composer packages. Uh, and then version 3 is going to just get rid of Code Night completely and use Laravel and a bunch more Composer stuff. These are the packages we use. Um, with random markdown, Dan Horrigan's capsule. If you're using, if you want to use Eloquent, uh, if, yeah, if you want to use Eloquent outside of Laravel, you need a bit of bootstrap, and it's kind of tricky. You want to do some configuration. That module means you don't have to do any configuration, so that's fun. Um, the password compatibility module by Anthony Ferrer here. Uh, everyone heard of the password hashing API for PHP 5.5? Don't have to wait until 5.5. It's a composer package that makes that exact same thing. In your, in your application. Um, an Illuminate database uh, is Carbon, uh, which I think Taylor mentioned earlier, uh, date system, caching library, simple pi, and Akismet. So we have all of those things integrated um, straight into PyroCMS with composer packages. And that's it. If you have any questions, this is an example of questions you shouldn't ask me. Um, I'm not Australian, I don't care about camel case, I don't care about tablet spaces, and PyroCMS doesn't support Mongo because shut up. If anybody else has any questions, I would be very happy to answer. How does um, Composer handle dependency complex? Kind of good question. Um, the way that it will work is it will say, I require, uh, each package has their own Composer JSON, so they can require a specific version. So if they're saying 1.0.0 something, then it's not going to try and install a new version. If you have Sometimes you get like into impossible situations yeah. where like one version says I need specifically this and another says I need specifically that and they'll throw an error. So you have to kind of work out yourself. Right? It's, I've not had as many impossible situations with Composer as I have when I've been building Ruby Gem based systems. So. <laughs> yep, anybody else? Sorry, hey. Right. Uh, do you think you've got any licensing concerns with uh, the value of using all these sort of third party uh, packages? It's a very good point. Yeah, so the question was about uh, licensing concerns of using different, uh, different packages. Most of the people putting that stuff up there are pretty cool about it. Um, I've, I've seen one or two on the DLAB license. Don't be a, can't swear. Don't be a, yeah, right. 
Um, yeah, most of them are like uh, GPL or BSD or MIT. Like, it's not really a problem for higher CMS. Um, I guess that's something you have to look into. In the same way that you download a random zip from like PHP classes, or you have to look into the license for that. So whenever you use any third party code, you have to wonder about if it's going to work with your, your, your licensing concerns. This is just an easier way to give you access to that code anyway. So instead of downloading it, if you reference it. Yes? Could you talk a little bit about um, what it's like to deploy uh, an application that you just Yes, so there's two kind of ways of doing it. A lot of people say, oh, I can't deploy this code because I don't have SSH access on my server, right? Um, you don't need it. I mean, when I when I do it, I, I use um, I use Capistrano or Chef to deploy my code anyway. So I have, uh, in my Chef cookbook, I have a little thing that says install Composer and then run it. So I deploy the code and then it uploads the packages that it needs and then they go onto the server. So as long as you're mostly referencing stable packages from people that you trust, that's okay. It could be an issue where you're just like pushing up random broken code. So you have like testing to get in the way. If you're just FTP syncing things, do it. It, it. it puts a vendor folder in there so you can just upload the vendor folder and all of your code's there straight away. Um, but what I prefer to do is I prefer to git ignore the vendor directory and the vendor uh, composer.log file. Leave that composer code out there, just commit the composer JSON, and then your repository is inferred with other people's code. It's just your code that you push up, and then it runs composer and install, and the code goes down and works with yourself. Yes? Uh, can you expand on that? Did you exclude um, the, uh, the vendor directory the repository, yeah. which I do? Um, then what happens if you suddenly don't have access and if you have to deploy and you don't have access or something changes? Um, how, 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 do you handle, how do you handle that? Because you have, basically you have a repository that you don't know quite what's, what it does. Yeah, so it can be very easy to get into situations where you're deploying broken code to your like server. Um, if you are very lax with the version numbers that you require, then you're going to have broken code in your server. Um, if you yeah, if, if Composer goes down as you try pushing your code, then you're going to have a broken server. Or if someone so, pulls, a, pulls a package from the repository. Mm -hmm. This is very true. So one thing you can do is set up a status repository, uh, which basically caches all the versions that you use. So if you lock it down and say, I want stable code, I want version 1, 2, 4 of this package, um, and then you uh, run status in the way, if Composer breaks temporarily, then status has all of those uh, versions of code um, cached. So that's something I'm saying at the moment after Friday where their service went down. I was like, oh great, I can't deploy anything because they're broke. Um, so yeah, it's that's what we're with that. Um, and I think I have to go now. So thank you very much, guys.